Yeah, Alex Pereira is good, but have you heard of Max Holloway? UFC 300 delivered in every way imaginable. From Zhang Weili's close fight to Alex Pereira's knockout of Jamal Hall Hill, um, the whole card was great. But there was one moment that stole the entire show, and that was Max Holloway's knockout of Justin Gaethje. He took on Justin Gaethje for the Blessed Man Forever belt, BMF as it is now known as, and the two, you know, they had a good fight. They had a really good fight, where you also had Zhang Wei Li take on Zhao Jingyan and had a lot of controversy in that fight. She choked her out, she knocked her out, and she took the decision, all in the same fight. And then, of course, at the top of the card, we had Alex Pereira versus Jamal Hill. That fight with a lot of controversy with Jamal Hill was one of those fights where it's like, um, I think Alex should win this, but who knows what, what Jamal Hill is. And now we know he's nothing compared to Alex Pereira. But Max Holloway stole the show all the way. Like his knockout of Justin Gaethje was just phenomenal. So that's what we're going to talk about first. The new Max Holloway. So everybody thinks Max Holloway is this the same guy that he used to be after or before the uh, Volkanovski fights, right? A lot of volume. He's coming in. He's switching a lot of stances, and he's he's pouring it on as much as he could. And he did that after Volkanovski a while too. Did it to Calvin Cater and to Yair Rodriguez. But after Alexander Volkanovski, the third fight, I noticed that Max Holloway is not fighting quite the same. Now, Abby from Fight Space, a good friend of mine, did an interview with Arnold Allen, and she asked me something like, hey, um, you have any questions for Arnold Allen? I was like, yeah, was there anything that surprised him about Max Holloway? Because, I mean, let's get insight to this guy. Holloway's one of the goats of the sport. And he said, yeah, Holloway didn't quite fight exactly like um, like I thought he would. He didn't come out hot, like hot guns a-blazing, and he didn't throw a lot of a volume. I was like, yeah, he's right. Uh, he did not do that. You know, um, Allen's a southpaw and Holloway kind of struggled with that in the past. And he fought really different against Korean zombie, kind of the same thing, you know, except for the fact that Korean zombie kind of went out there and, uh, died on his shield. This fight with Justin Gaethje, the same thing. I think it's safe to say Max Holloway doesn't fight with volume anymore. Instead, he's selective with his shots. He picks his shots, and he wants to make sure his shots are going to keep him safe and not put him in harm's way while he lands strikes. A fantastic performance. So we saw um, some really good reads from Max Holloway against Justin Gaethje. Now, Early in the fight, at the end of the first round, Max did his little spinning back kick that he does when somebody's against the fence. He does it really cool because he keeps his um his leg in tight and then he kicks it back kind of like a, a donkey kick or something. And Max caught him in the nose and broke his nose. And that dimensionally changed the fight the whole way. First round was a very tepid affair. Um, the two were kind of going tit for tat, and, you know, really, really kind of slow. But after he broke Gaethje's nose, you could see Max Holloway started to... I want to say turn up the volume, but we just got done talking about how he doesn't turn up the volume like he used to. We, we don't see much of the Calvin Cater anymore. Instead, what we see from Max Holloway is this this fighter that's going to select his shots and land good blows. Now, obviously, when he hurt Gaethje in, what, the fourth or fifth round, he started to pour it on. But that's just called a finishing instinct. Justin Gaethje... He kept doing the same thing over and over, the low kick, and it, it wasn't having the effect I thought it would on Holloway. Holloway didn't check all of them. He was His leg was very compromised, um, and that was kind of a read that you pull from the Volkanovski fights, especially the first one where Volkanovski landed a lot of low kicks, and that's really kind of what took the mobility out of Max Holloway. But here, Justin Gaethje kind of, he was landing the low kicks, but he was getting put on his back foot a lot, and Gaethje doesn't like kicking off of his back foot. So that was a good read from Holloway. Another good read from Holloway was the fact that Justin Gaethje leans every single time he leans. And that's how he caught him with the low kick. I mean, with the spinning back kick, he leans to his left. And that's where Max was like, OK, I've got something for it. So what he did was instead of just kind of letting him lean and do that, I was calling for the step up high kick with that. But he didn't throw that either. Instead, he's looking for that rear uppercut. And that was money for Max Holloway all night, the rear uppercut. Because, man, he really started to put it on and land that rear uppercut. And as Gaethje's nose is broken, every time he punches Gaethje to the nose, Gaethje kind of just you know backs away like, oh, this is painful. You can't blame him. You really can't. 
this fight absolutely phenomenal ending so the ending we remember the max holloway ricardo llamas fight where let's go and the two banging out in the middle of the cage i think he's done that again afterwards too i think that was like the holloway fight he did that too maybe he did it to aldo i don't quite remember where he did it again yair maybe no anyways this time he caught gaethje over the top with i think it was a right hook slumped justin gaethje just Gaethje was dead on the map. Beautiful. Just a fantastic performance from Max Holloway. He, he got, let's go. Let's throw down. When Max Holloway tells you to do that, do not engage. Don't do it. No. Back away. Run, run, run. Go, go, go. Whew, what a fight, though. That really did steal the show at UFC 300. I thought, you know, going into this fight, I was kind of like, you know, Max Holloway, he's lost a step, but I, you know, I always question, like, is, is his reads, is he changing as a fighter? Is he adapting to what his body's telling him? Because he's not as fast as he once was at 32 now. Yeah, he picks his shots better now. He, he, he doesn't pour on the volume. Instead, he's trying to stay safe, not give you an opening. He's famously the, you know, the most strikes landed in UFC history and the most strikes absorbed in UFC history. He's trying to change that actively. And I think that's a good idea. Uh, and, you know, I think this new version of Max Holloway really kind of showed us what he can be and how long he could be in this game. Just 32 years old, right? But this is a young man's game. He called out Islam. He called out Taporia. I mean, he's the number one contender in both, both probably, except for maybe, he's probably like second or third in, in, in Featherweight. But still, he's he's the guy to, to go to. So he's going to get whatever he wants. And that went over Gaethje, puts him there, he puts him at number one at lightweight, puts him, uh, let's see, I don't have the rankings pulled up, I have the topology pulled up, so let me pull it up real quick. Yeah, so number one at lightweight, at featherweight, he's number two. Volkanovski, if he can't fight in Spain whenever Taporia wants to fight, Holloway's going to be the fight to make. So he has options. And then, of course, he mentioned in his post-fight conference that he he's very, very um, interested in, you know, Conor McGregor. Well, he he name dropped Conor, but he didn't really. He isn't really actually interested in that. I I don't think. I think that's more if the opportunity presents himself. Then again, Dana White announced that um, Conor McGregor and Michael Chandler at UFC 303 in um, June International Fight Week, whatever that is. But yeah, good win for Max. One of those moments just like reminded everybody like he's that dude. Like he said in his post fight, I am him. He is him. He is him fantastic performance so uh i want to talk about all these fights i really do guys so i'm gonna have to cut some of it short like usually we go a little bit more in depth but today we'll have to kind of keep it more um organized so let's talk about the main event alex Pereira versus jamal hill obviously Pereira is your light heavyweight champion jamal hill was your light heavyweight champion until he uh snapped his achilles playing basketball for the ufc so how does this fight go? I in my in my the the beginning of um, my study for Alex Pereira, I was really interested in how he dealt with the southpaw. And Jamal Hill, he, he's a southpaw. Yeah, he switches stances, but it's not really a good stance switch. And so he, you know, he just kind of does his thing. But Jamal Hill, southpaw. So how is Pereira going to deal with this? And you know, obviously we turn to the Israel Adesanya fights there because he's consistently going from southpaw to orthodox with Alex Pereira. Um, with low kicks being such a big part of his game, it's important to know what type of low kick you can kick and what kind you can't. So if you remember the first Dustin Poirier, Justin Gaethje fight, um, this is something I go, I went back to a lot in the lead up to this fight, but kicking, uh, with your rear leg against a Southpaw is an inside low kick. And that opens you up to the left counter from the Southpaw. Now, granted, it's going to be the same. For you if he kicks the inside of your leg but you're not the southpaw you're the orthodox fighter southpaw's more used to it and he knows what to throw as a southpaw so alex Pereira, he implemented and he did this against uh israel asanya he did it against bruno silva anybody who switch stances uh he 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 kind of jerry yuri Parhaska, who we're going to talk about later um step up low kick Every single time. So make sure he's always kicking the outside of your leg. And that's what he did against Jamal Hill. He, he kicked the outside of the leg. 
and that led to his knockout finish at UFC 300. It was really cool. Um, the, it was the left hook that did it at 314 in the round, and it you see Alex Pereira, like, he's patient, and he's not going to make a bad decision standing up, or he tries not to. He's an offensive fighter. He does open himself up to being hit, sure, um, but when he's figuring you out, especially in that first round, he's not trying to make a mistake. Instead, he's trying to poke you, prod you to see what's up. And he saw what's up. So the finishing se sequence was kind of cool. So um, I saw Luke Thomas explain it like this. So the Southpaw versus Orth or the Orthodox versus Orthodox matchup, the two fighters' feet are like this. Feet are like this. Um, with the Southpaw versus Orthodox, you're like this, to where the two feet or front feet are together, whereas they're opposite each other in the traditional bladed matchup. So you have the lead feet together and it, this was really cool he, he you know he's fighting the hands and and touching the hands and he's changing speed and that's what led to the left hook but another thing you'll notice um if you pay close attention to his feet obviously a lot of the talk is about the outside foot advantage against alex um against jamal hill alex per did a foot stomp which is legal in mma not in boxing, but it's a thing in boxing. So if you're fighting like Shakur Stevenson's really good at this, he'll step on the lead foot of somebody so they can't exit. He's stepping on the lead foot, and he, he's punching. Alex Pereira, I don't know if this was intentional or not, but he stepped on the lead foot with a lead stomp or with a foot stomp. Not trying to, like, stomp his foot. I don't think like uh, Kamar Usman versus Jorge Masvidal won. Think more like um, I'm stepping on your foot like I kind of did a breakdown on Aaron Pico. Um, and he, he used the foot stomp in wrestling a lot. It's illegal there too, but he did it anyway. Um, and that's what he did there. Jamal Hill couldn't, you know, back out. And Pereira lands the left hook. Now, he could have gone the way of Jalen Turner and tried to do a walk-off and let Jamal Hill back into this. Instead, he did pour on the ground and pound. And obviously, the ref called it off. So what's next for Alex Pereira? He obviously mentioned heavyweight. And I don't know why everybody is so hell-bent on him going to heavyweight. I particularly don't like it, but... If we have to have Alex Pereira fight at heavyweight, let's, you know, he, he weighed 230, which is what Stipe Miocic fought at when he was at heavyweight around that weight, 230-240. So if, if we're hell-bent on him going to heavyweight, Cyril Gon's a fight to make. Um, I, I think that's, you know, I have no interest no interest in seeing Alex Pereira get wrestled into oblivion by Tom Aspinall or by John Jones. Instead, I want to see Alex Pereira Try out heavyweight first. Let's see how his power translates. Let's see how his weight translates um, and his gas tank. Let's see how that all translates over before we make that jump. But the logical choice is it's Magomed and Kaliev. And Kaliev's next in line at, at 205. Um, he's he's the number three contender, and Jamal Hill will drop down below him. Yuri Prohaska will move up to the number one contender. I don't see them making that fight because Alex just knocked him out. But... I can see them making Magomed and Kalev. And Kalev hasn't lost since 2018 against Paul Craig. He's the guy. He's the guy. And he's beat Alex um, Alexander. He's beat um, Tiago Santos and Anthony Smith. That's two title challengers. He just got a win over Johnny Walker. A fantastic knockout. I mean, looking at the rankings, like light heavyweight's weird. He got the draw with Jan Bohovic. Like, I don't... Man, I, I have a hard time saying he, he deserves to be um, the title shot. I really do, actually. Because, like, sure, he's good, but he hadn't really beat the who's who of, of the division, if that makes sense. So, yeah, and Kaliev. Now, my selfish pick is going to be um, Izzy. Is he five? Is he three? However you want to count it. Obviously, this wouldn't be able to go down. The other two you can potentially make for UFC 301. Um, this one, though, you can't make for UFC 301 because Israel Adesanya is going to need to fight Drickus Duplessis and win. Um, and that's a winnable fight for him. I, I'll agree with that. But he's going to have to do that first. That way we can have a champion versus champion matchup. They're one and one in MMA. And Izzy's tried to get the belt at 205 in the past. What a better way to go out than to have Israel Adesanya versus Alex Pereira, champion versus champion, one and one, settling the rivalry. That's a huge fight. And I, I talked about that in our pre-fight. I talked about how I thought Alex Pereira um, and Israel Adesanya five, because if you count the kickboxing matches, there, there'd be four that we've had already, plus a fifth one. 
Um, if you if you count all those, then you've got you know a big pay per view on your hand. So yeah, Jamal Hill just kind of didn't show us enough. So you know whatever. Uh, let's see next on the card: Zhang Wei Li versus Yan Zhao Zhan, the first ever Chinese versus Chinese matchup in title fight history. Zhang Wei Li was the incumbent champion, a fantastic twenty five and three record. Yan Zhao Zhan, 17 and 4, fought her way up after um, losing to Carla Esparza and Marina Rodriguez via split decision. She rallied her way back to a win over Mackenzie Dern and had that fantastic right that knocked out Jessica Andrade. Earned her title shot. Jane Wei Li, um, obviously, you know, the Rose Nama Yunus fights weren't weren't uh, particularly pretty for her, but they happened. Whew, Yan Zhao Zhan really did go out there and make a point. And she lost this fight. She lost this fight handily, I think. But there were several times to where, you know, I think Zhang Wei Li was kind of looking for like her John Jones moment. Like, hey, I want to strike with you. And then she realized, oh, I'm not, I am not him, you know. If we're going to recycle sayings from the from the night, right? So yeah, um, this fight, Zhang Wei Li um, had to really rely on her wrestling and good on her. You know, these type of fights and uh, Ghost, if he's listening, he'll 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 be first to say that this fight is not indicative of the kind of work that they put in on their camp. And I don't want to say Zhang Wei Li took this fight lightly. I don't think she did. I think Yan Zhao Zhen came in and overperformed what everybody thought. There's some comments on my, my YouTube channel to where it was like, um, yeah, I, I think Yan Zhao Zhen or Zhang Wei Li is going to run through Yan Zhao Zhen. She was there the whole way. Her wrestling looked much improved. So we remember the Carla Sparza fight with Yan Zhao Zhen. I think that was the Sparza. But. She she can't wrestle. Yeah, that was Carla Esparza crucifixed. Um, then the Marina Rodriguez fight was very close. That'd be a good one to run back. But I don't know if they'll be able to actually because Marina I think lost to Andrade on this card. I don't remember. Yeah, she lost to Andrade split decision. Yeah, that's a fun fight though. I mean, Jane Wee Lee. I don't know what's next for her. Um, there's obviously, you know, Tatiana Suarez is ranked number two. There's also, um, you know, there's, there's, there's flyweight. Yeah. Flyweight. Alexa Grasso and Valentina Shevchenko. You got to let that the division kind of play out though. Cause they've kind of got their, their, their ducks in a row. You know, they got Grasso and Shevchenko about to fight again after they coached the ultimate fighter. You got Manon Farrell, you got Aaron Blanchfield who just lost and then you got Macy Barber. So, like, that division has to sort itself out, I believe. Um, but, you know, she has some options going forward. I, I think um, I think her next fight will definitely be at straw weight, and I think Tatiana Suarez could be that fight. She already beat Amanda Limos. She beat Andrade for a title. Verna Janaroba's there. Um, she's got a couple wins to go. Marina Rodriguez just lost. So, yeah, I, I think it's pretty clear what, what's next for her. All right, next, we already talked about Holloway and Gaethje, but Armin Saryukin and Charles Oliveira, that was a very good fight. Um, Armin Saryukin very early on kind of was looking good. Charles Oliveira striking is high level, top notch. I, I really do I think he's one of the better strikers in uh, the division, despite being so terrifying as a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. That said, Armin Saryukin came out and he had a really good game plan. He looked for control before ground and pound. But he he threw a kick early, slipped and let Charles get on his back, managed to survive the first round and continue to fight. Second round he kind of controlled Oliveira. Who, sorry, late night and I'm yawning and I shouldn't be for this. But yeah. <laughs> uh Armistar, you can really kind of controlled the second round. And third round was very, very close. It was a submission almost there, and Saryukin managed to to get out of it. Now, a lot of people were fussing because, you know, Armin Saryukin was 
basically controlling the whole round in that last like 40 seconds he he was being choked out but he survived it's like oh this is you know this sucks why is he getting this kind of a treatment and he should have lost trollers little barrel should want yeah but submissions aren't going to pr- cause damage and damage is the number one criteria for looking at damage you know Oliveira was the one that had the bloody hairline and Armin Saryukin was the guy that kind of was just he was the guy that was landing the elbows on the top. He was on top. He was chewing up the, the, the clock. And if you're chewing up the clock, you're winning the fight. You know, as, as crappy as it sounds. But, like, yeah. So now, so you can, he'll probably move up to the number two spot. Uh, let's see what the rankings are for lightweight. Um, then now it's Dustin Poirier versus Islam Makachev for the title. So, yeah, Justin Gaethje will probably. Okay, so here's what's going to happen. They're going to put Poirier at number one because he's getting the title shot and he beat Max Holloway. Max Holloway will go to number two because of his win at Justin Gaethje. Armin Saryukin will move up one spot to three. Oh, let's see. Poirier, Max, two. Yeah, Armin Saryukin will move up one spot to three. That sucks for him, right? Uh, but if Holloway doesn't want to fight and he he's booked to fight Ilya Taporia, Armin can see himself kind of in action at the end of the year. Um kind of jump Max Holloway if he decides not to fight for the title at 155. So, go win for Sergey Yukin. You know, I'm, 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 I was really, you got Gaethje, Poirier, and Michael Chandler, those three guys, uh, kind of hogging the top, and you give these young guns opportunities. You give Benoit Saint-Denis an opportunity. You give Rafael Faziev an opportunity to uh, break into the top. Um, Benil Dariush had his opportunity. Charles Oliveira is another guy that was kind of there, but not really fighting the contenders, but Oliveira took on a contender in Armas Aryukin, and he won. Um, you know, Darius and, and Charles fought, and that eliminated Darius from the contention for a while. So, yeah. Next up, Bo Nickel versus Cody Brundage. Bo Nickel, um, Cody Brundage was just a grown man in there. Um, yeah, Bo Nickel moved to 6-0. and oh, First time he's ever been in a, a, a second round. That was cool to see, but, like, Nickel, um, yeah, he... Didn't really land too good of striking. Uh, he landed a couple shots, but it wasn't like, oh, his striking is great. Like his last fight against, uh, where he got the knockout, Val Woodburn. Like, that wasn't, nah, you know. I want to see this guy go deep. Yeah. NCAA wrestler, um, one of the best at Penn State. And he, he's just a fun fighter. But yeah, this, this fight really showed us where Bo Nickel was at. And he's not going to get the fast track like, Alex Pereira did so like Alex Pereira has a lot of finishing ability whereas Bo Nickel kind of has really good finishing ability but this fight I think showed us more of what Bo Nickel's going to be for a while and that is controlling people and with that wrestling pedigree like can you blame him you know um he he, he needs time to work on his striking I, f- I fully expect him to get more of the Patty Pimblett treatment where it's like a slow build or the Sean O'Malley treatment like slow build you fight nobody you fight nobody you're fighting nobody and then it's like bam here's Paulo Costa or bam here's Sean Strickland they're gonna throw him in a number one contender fight after several fights and you're like why is he getting the number one contender then he can potentially get the opportunity to overperform and there he is number one again like Sean O'Malley who beat Petter Yan so yeah I mean Bo Nickel um yeah, he shouldn't have been on the main card, but I get they're pushing the American. Um, yeah, fun fight, I guess. You know, I don't know what's next for him. I said, uh, who was it? I said not Tavares. Was it Tavares? I don't know. I said somebody on Twitter, but uh, Sherdog Keith Chillian said actually Chris Weidman versus Bo Nickel. That's the uh, best fight. It's a big name to build his name, and you know. You get Bo Nickel in a long fight with somebody who can wrestle. I like that. I think Chris Weidman versus Bo Nickel is a fun fight. So let's book that one. Let's move on to the prelims. We're going to start moving a hair bit faster here. Um, Yuri Prohaska versus Alexander Rakic. This was a big fight. Rakic obviously blew his knee out in his last fight. And Yuri Prohaska lost his title to, or lost a shot at the title to Alex Pereira. Um, And that was the vacant title. But Yuri Prohaska really... Ate a lot of low kicks, as he always does here, but he kept coming forward against Alexander Rakic. And eventually, Alexander Rakic, his his his, his striking, a lot of the straight punches were landing. A lot of low kicks were landing, but he couldn't deal with Yuri Prohaska's 
forward pressure. Good win for Prohaska. You know, it puts him at the number one spot. It denies a contender. And, you know, I could see a, a, a future where he fights for the title again really soon. That said, I don't think he gets it now. So who do we book your Prohaska against? You know, Jan Blahovic is, is somebody I think is a really good one. Um, I think they fought already, did they? No, he did not. I forget he was a quick rise too. But yeah, Jan Blahovic is a good one. Um, and Kalaev, if they decide to have Alex Pereira go to heavyweight or fight Izzy, yeah, there's some options out there for him. Um, Khalil Roundtree is another fun one I would like to see. Uh, Khalil versus Jerry would be just hyper-violent. Count me all the way in. Uh, Rakic, he's still really good, man. Like, a lot of people poo-poo on him because, like, yeah, he, he's boring, blah, blah. But he, like, he punches straight, and that's all I'm asking for here. He Just please punch straight. Yeah. Um, Yuri, you know, kept coming forward the entire fight. Yeah, he got made fun of for being a fake samurai. I get it. He was kind of upset about it, but he did, like, I may not be a real samurai, but I just live by the code. I'm like, oh, all right, well, whatever you say, you're weird, and you're a fun fighter, so I like you. Uh, you know, Rakic couldn't really handle Yuri Prohaska's um, bludgeoning, and eventually, you know, he, he got put away. So, good win for, for Yuri Prohaska. I'm happy to see him get back to it. I was worried because I was like, it's coming back pretty soon from that knockout to Alex Pereira. I, yeah, I don't know if that's a good idea, but he got on, got on UFC 300, got a big highlight win. Uh, managed to get an award, $300,000 bonus for it. All right, next fight, Aljamain Sterling and Calvin Cater. So Calvin Cater, you know, the featherweight, this was Aljamain Sterling, the former Bantamweight champion's featherweight debut. And he looked good. Uh, Sterling looked hyper thick, boy. Whoo, he was thick. He was big at Bantamweight, but like he looked big here too. How much weight was he cut? And I remember I interviewed him a while back. He said it was like 30 pounds he cut. So I'm like, geez, to get to 132, that is tough. Ugh. Um, But yeah, he managed to you know, keep keep the forward pressure, get Cater down, and he didn't give Calvin Cater much room to breathe because uh, he knows Calvin Cater's not going to like rock, like take him down or anything like that. Ooh, three on the trot to Calvin Cater. One and four in his last five. Ooh, that's a bad run for, for Cater. But yeah, Sterling looked really good, man. His featherweight debut. I was worried like he wouldn't find a home here, but this will put him in the top ten, I believe. Um, I believe Calvin. Yeah, Calvin Cater was number eight. So let's see him against like Yair Rodriguez or Ooh. Let's do Aljamain Sterling versus Brian Ortega. Aljamain Sterling versus Brian Ortega. That's a fun fight. Ortega's obviously the jiu-jitsu guy. He's got really good boxing. Aljamain Sterling's a wrestling guy. He wants to get you down. Let's put Brian Ortega on his back. See if Aljamain Sterling can get backpacked on him. <laughs> and that's what he kind of did to, to, to cater all night, you know, backpack and all that. So, yeah. Next one. Doom, Kayla Harrison and Holly Holm. The debut of Kayla Harrison coming over from PFL took on the history to Holly Holm, who is ancient now like holly is 42 years old kayla is 33 holly's been around but she's also won around too she's beat a lot of people um no contest to myra buena silva she lost that fight she beat yana santos lost to ketlin vieira uh, obviously she just she realized the title against ronda rousey the the iconic second round head kick in 2015 but just since then it's just been downhill for holly home Three straight losses to Tate Shevchenko and Durandami, beat Bet Correa, lost to Cyborg, beat Anderson, lost to Nunez, then she got a win-win, lost to Vieira, uh, beat Santos, no contest to Marabona Silva because Silva did marijuana, and now they lost to Kayla Harrison. Kayla Harrison looked good. I don't know why Holly Holm decided to clinch with her. I didn't think that was a good idea, and turns out it wasn't. Holly Holm got the takedown, or not Holly, I'm sorry, Kayla Harrison got the takedown, and eventually home uh she reversed it she got back up and kayla you know got the takedown again what do you expect from a two-time judoka olympic medalist diego lopez um knocked out sadiq yusuf uh lopez is that guy um this is a 145 fighter he's now ranked he's going to be ranked come tuesday when they redo the rankings 
I, I really like Diego Lopez. He's fun. He almost beat Mozart of Loyev, and I'd like to see them run that back eventually. That that would be really fun. Hanato Moicano and Jalen Turner. Turner was really working on 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 Hanato Moicano. And Moicano, who is now kind of a, a older veteran of the sport because he's been in the UFC for some time. Um, let's see, when did he make his UFC debut? Oh, goodness. That was a long, 2014. He's been in the UFC for forever. Beat Jeremy Stevens, lost to Ortega, Calvin Cater, Cub Swanson, Jose Aldo. This dude has fought some people. Yeah, I, I like it. I like I like Moicano. He managed to, you know, really get the takedown and start to, to wear on Jalen Turner, who couldn't do anything. And Turner just turned in and said, I'm done for the night. You know, so Jalen Turner, who had all the hype of beating Bobby Green, who we're going to talk about soon, uh, drops the ball. Yeah, it sucks to suck, but whatever. Jessica Andrade beat Marina Rodriguez. Marina looks really good early on in fights. She punches straight. Uh, so just, I, I look for that in MMA fighters because it's like, wow, we, we should be doing this more often. Uh, but Andrade like clawed her way back into it. And that's just her being a savvy old vet and just as grindy as can be. Bobby Green beat Jim Miller. Man, that one was sad. You know, Obviously, Jim Miller had the UFC 100, 200, and 300. Um, yeah, it was a big accomplishment. He was talking about maybe I won't retire. I thought he should have retired tonight. But Bobby Green, after getting hurt early in the first round, kind of started to work on Jim Miller, and I was, it was sad. I really was like pulling for Miller to get the third win. Uh, but Bobby Green, uh, as much as I don't like him, I don't think he's that great of a fighter. He he looked good here. You know, he, he discovered a game plan that worked for him against Jim Miller, who kept coming forward on a straight line. Bobby Green did not. Uh, last. Davis and Figueredo, Cody Garbrandt opened up the card. Uh, I really expected something different from this, more of a hyper-violent fight. And before this fight, I was talking to my buddies. Uh, we were watching the fight, and we were talking about how you never really see Cody on his back too much. you know. And then Figueredo went and did that and put him down, rear naked, choke. All in all, UFC 300, one of the best cards of all time. Yeah, I don't know if it's the best. UFC 217 is definitely up there. Uh, but like this card was really good. And they, I mean, it was good because they stacked it. You know, you just open it with Figueredo versus Cody Garbrandt. You got Diego Lopez's up and comer, Kayla Harrison's debut, Sterling Prohaska. You got Bo Nickel, who everybody's excited for. Sorry, you can, and then obviously the 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 trilogy at the top. You got Holloway, off and Justin Gaethje, Zhang Wei Li. Yeah, it was a good. It was a performance. <laughs> she got the win. It was a closer fight than a lot of people thought. So that over delivered, and then obviously. The Alex Pereira fight, which uh, we did a big state tape study on Alex Pereira uh, two weeks before this fight, just to kind of give everybody an idea of what he does, what he does good, and turns out it's a lot that he does good. I enjoyed it, um, but that tape study, obviously, it is up on the channel. You can see how he sets that left hook up, what makes his low kick so special, and all that because he he's a special fighter. I don't know if he's a special go to heavyweight fighter from middleweight, but he is a special fighter and. Despite everybody knowing what's coming from him, he still lands that left hook and those low kicks. It's wild. 